want to talk today about moral foundations theory. I've talked some about various forms of ethical intuitionism, including the form that is really about the structure of the normative realm and the fact that there are different kinds of things we value, they come into conflict, the realm is complex in the sense that there are no universal rules for resolving those conflicts, and then a different sense, a sense in which it's really about the process of moral reasoning. And it says intuitive responses, intuition, conscience, if you want to think of it this way, or affective responses, emotions, they are really primary. We form judgments on the basis of those, and then we engage in ex post facto reasoning, reasoning after the fact, to try to find out whether that was really the right reaction, to try to persuade others, resolve conflicts and disagreements with others, reach collective decisions, provide reasons and justifications for our own responses, and so forth. Well, you might think on that latter conception, ethical intuitionism in the sense of relying on intuition, these feelings, these immediate spontaneous responses, there'd be nothing to say about ethical theory except, well, listen to your heart, <laughs> uh, let your conscience be your guide, at least your conscience as given criticism and feedback by reason in some fashion, and then you might go on to say something about reason, but basically there's nothing more to say about these spontaneous and intuitive responses. That's just our neurophysiology, it's the result of evolution, it's a subconscious practice, and just boom, there it is. But in fact, Haidt and his collaborators, the people who developed this view of social intuitionism, have a different perspective. They think that if you examine people's moral responses to hypothetical and real scenarios, uh, in moral and uh, politically loaded speeches that they give, in various forms of discourse, in moral disagreements, and in all sorts of other settings, you find out that there are a few basic foundations of moral reasoning. That is to say, not only when people explicitly, as part of that conscious reason system, give reasons, but when you analyze their intuitive responses and say, what's really underlying that? What are they thinking about, or what are they subconsciously responding to? There are five basic dimensions. Now, he does say there are, for some people, maybe a sixth. But in any case, there are five primary dimensions of moral reasoning. So it seems important, both for understanding the nature of our own intuitive responses and the kinds of reasons that we're ultimately capable of giving, to understand what those five foundations are. That's what moral foundations theory tries to describe. Well, the five foundations are things that actually emerge from Haidt's research on the differences between liberals and conservatives. He found that when he asked people not only about their own views, but then about the views of people on the other side, people who were conservative were actually quite accurate in describing what liberals thought and why they thought that. Liberals, on the other hand, were terrible at saying what conservatives thought and why they thought that. And so he was puzzled by this. He's a liberal himself. But he thought, well, wait a minute, what's going on? Why is it that liberals have very little understanding of conservatives, and why do conservatives have a pretty good understanding of liberals? Now, you can give all sorts of explanations about this, but what he did is then begin to study these foundations of reasoning and came up with what he took to be a very surprising result, which is that there are these five basic dimensions. But as he puts it, liberals decide largely on the basis of two of these five. Conservatives pay attention to all five. And so when liberals stress arguments and give reasons based on the two, well, those are among the considerations that conservatives take seriously too. So they completely understand the liberals' reasons and the liberals' position. but. Liberals, when they look at conservative positions and arguments, often find them unintelligible. Why? Because there are these three other foundations that do not play the same role in liberal thinking, but play an important role in conservative thinking. And once you take that into account, you realize, wait, a lot of what is driving these guys in their decision making, in their reasoning processes, in their public justifications and so on, don't make any sense to the people on the other side. They tend to read it as something very different because they don't use those categories. Now, I think all this is oversimplified in several different respects. I suspect that none of these categories are just zero for anyone, but there is a huge difference in emphasis. A second thing to worry about is that Haidt's conception of liberals and conservatives is by now a little bit outdated. A lot of people who identify with the left part of the political spectrum are not liberals at all in his sense. And some people who identify with the right part of the spectrum aren't really conservatives in his sense either. 
So we should be careful about drawing any big conclusions about the contemporary political scene. Liberalism and conservatism and right and left have changed somewhat over the decades. And in addition to that, I think there is more a difference of degree here than there is a total difference of kind. Nevertheless, there's a real point, and whether you buy the political connection or not, and a lot of people would look at this and say, yeah, I, I don't think that's the right analysis of political discussions and political disagreements, but still, I think the research on the basic foundations of moral decision-making holds. So what are these five foundations? Well, one of them, maybe the most basic, is harm and care. And if we want to put this in terms of some principles, kind of like W.D. Ross's principles, you know, keep your promises, make amends, be grateful, be fair, etc., maybe we could say, yeah, one of them actually is right there on Ross's list. Don't hurt people. That's the harm part. And then another is intimately connected to his idea of helping people care for others. Care for people. I'm saying here people rather than just others, because actually I think it's important that you not hurt yourself and that you care for yourself too, as well as caring for others. Of course, usually we don't have too many problems caring for ourselves. It's the problem is learning to care for other people. But in any case, that's the basic idea. Then, of course, much more follows from that. But this idea of not causing harm to others, of caring for others, not only in the sense of helping them when you have an opportunity, but also just being concerned, being kind toward other people, being empathetic, all of that seems like a very important part of moral thinking. The second dimension he identifies, he calls fairness reciprocity. That's the dimension that if we want to put it in terms of categories like this, it says, well, what? As W.D. Ross put it, as far as my summary went, be fair. Or the reciprocity part is, you know, maintain some degree of equality. Now, the degree of equality and the kind of equality may vary a lot depending on the circumstance. Sometimes it really just means, look, if somebody does something nice for you, do something nice for them. That includes that idea of being grateful. Sometimes it may mean, um, you know, look, the children are here, they're all expecting pieces of birthday cake. Give each one a birth piece of birthday cake. Make them roughly equal size and so forth. So this involves some kind of equality. But again, there's a huge amount of variation here and lots of room to disagree about that. That's part of the reason that people with different political perspectives, for example, disagree even when it comes to these kinds of principles that everyone shares and everyone considers important. Some think I, it's really this kind of equality, an equality of opportunity we should be concerned with. Others say, no, I'm more interested in equality of outcomes and equality of results. Some people are going to say, I'm very concerned about the rule of law. I want to make sure everybody is treated equally under the law. Someone else may say, but, but wait a minute, I think some people don't have equal opportunities, and so actually the law has to bend in their favor. Whatever you think about those kinds of issues, you're not really disagreeing that equality and fairness matter. You think they matter. It's just a question of, well, in exactly what way they matter. What dimension of equality are we concerned about? What exactly is fairness in this kind of case? And there can be plenty of room for disagreement about that just as there can be disagreement about what hurts people and what helps them, or what expresses concern for someone and what doesn't. Now those he takes to be foundational and important to everyone's moral and political thinking. Notice that they are individual. When I hurt people, I hurt individual people. When I care for people, that's a matter of caring for individual people. I'm empathizing with that friend who is telling me they had a rough day. I am helping that person I find on the street whose wheelchair is broken and desperately needs help to get where they're going. And so I do things like that for specific people. And similarly here, I face issues of fairness with respect to specific people, specific situations. I try to preserve equality in some particular respect for some particular person or class of persons. The others that are coming up are more, well, you might say, group-oriented. So he calls these two together the individualizing foundations. There is this individual aspect of morality. But there are these others, the ones that he thinks get de-emphasized or forgotten about completely by people on the left of the political spectrum, that are group-oriented. He calls those the binding foundations. 
And to understand what's going on here, we really have to think about the purpose of morality, period. I've been describing the basic questions of ethics as what should I be, what should I do, and how should I decide. It's a question of what to be, what to do, how to decide. Those are individually framed questions. And so those are a kind of common ground that everyone accepts, everyone thinks those are important. But now if I think about what morality is all about, is it really about guiding individual lives, individual decision making, individual processes of character formation? Or is it primarily about groups? Is it about how groups of people can live together, each pursuing their own interests, without getting in each other's way? in a way that is productive for all the members of the group and not a question of a conflict of all against all. Thomas Hobbes worried that without authority, then life would be a war of everyone against everyone. Life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And so you might say the whole purpose of morality, just as he thinks the purpose of government, the perfect purpose of law, and any kind of authority, is really to prevent that to let groups of people work together, to let groups of people to survive together and thrive together. Well, if that's foundational, then we might say, yes, what to be as an individual, what to do as an individual, um, how to decide as an individual person, those are all important questions, but put them in the context of the larger picture. This is about how we get along together, how we are able to thrive as a social group together. Human beings are essentially social. They're not just individual autonomous beings. And once you recognize that people are social, you recognize, wait a minute, I should be thinking about groups and what groups should be and what groups should do and how groups should decide. So those are in part political and organizational questions, but I also need to think about my role in the group. It's not just what kind of person to be as if I'm there alone on an island like Robinson Crusoe. It's not just what to do as if I'm making all these decisions by myself in isolation, independent of what anyone else does, free of any kind of context. No, I am part of a social group. And part of my obligations are to be concerned not only with my own welfare and my own proper ethical decision making, but also the welfare of my group. So when I think about that, I think, well, look, I'm supposed to be strengthening my group and preserving it. And that leads to me to say, well, not harming other people in the group. Yeah, that's part of that. Being fair to people in the group. Yes, that's part of that. But there are other considerations too. So what other considerations? There is this. First of all, what group am I a part of, right? There is something that he refers to as in-group loyalty. I distinguish those in my group from those who are outside my group. Now, on some conceptions, wow, that's bad. That's nationalism, that's racism, that's ethnocentrism, that's xenophobia, etc., etc. I should be thinking about all human beings all the time as if they're all equal. But of course I don't do that. I'm part of specific social groups. I am not a citizen of Romania, for example. That's not a group that's particularly relevant to me. Now, I have no ill feelings about the citizens of Romania. By all means, I wish them all well. But you might say, look, I'm not really part of that group. The welfare of that group and their success at working together as Romanians, that's not my problem. <laughs> that's their problem. And in other ways, too, there are groups I'm a part of. There are other groups I'm simply not a part of. I am a professor at a university. I have special obligations to that university. I want to preserve and strengthen that university. That's an obligation I have as an employee. There are many, many other companies, many other organizations, like colleges and universities, for that matter, in my own country and, of course, across the world. I don't have the same kinds of obligations to them. It is not my problem what's going on at the University of Paris right now, for example. I don't know if anything's going on at the University of Paris, but whatever it is, it's not my problem. I'm not part of that group. And the same thing could be said about a lot of us. We're part of, well, many groups. I'm part of a family. I am part of a community here in the city I live in. I am a resident of my state. I'm a citizen of my country. I am also part of the philosophical community. I am somebody who has all sorts of group connections. I should worry about all those groups. But in all those respects, I distinguish people who are in the group from people who are out of the group. I think I have obligations to my students that I don't have to the public at large. I think I have obligations to my family members that I don't have other, to other people. I have obligations to my fellow citizens that I don't have to citizens of other countries. And so that's an important part of things. 
There are all sorts of special obligations, as W.D. Ross puts it, that go beyond my obligations to everyone. So how could I put this? Well, in terms of a, a proposition, like be fair or don't hurt people, care for people, and so on, one might be simply be loyal. Be loyal to my group. I'm supposed to be loyal to my country, to my university, to my family, to other people who form a group with me. If I'm part of that organization, I should be loyal to that organization. And of course, that also means, well, I owe a special duty to the people in that organization. So I owe a special level of care to them. I'm just going to say here, there are some special duties I have. What duties will depend on the organization? Loyalty to my family will include helping and taking care of my children. It'll involve loyalty and fidelity to my spouse. It will involve serving my parents. It will involve all sorts of duties that go along with being a good member of a family. They aren't just this general kind of thing. They're more specific. And that's something that's an important part of moral life, too. There are other kinds of considerations. There is a consideration, a foundation, that these theorists call authority and respect. I am not only a member of a group, I occupy a position in those groups. And those groups have often a hierarchical character to them. Some people are higher in the hierarchy of the group, some people are lower. I owe special obligations to those above me in the group. I should respect their authority and listen to them and obey their authority, all other things equal. I should care for those and nurture those who are below me in this organization. I should be friendly and care for the people at the same level. And so I've got special things here. So I might say, look, what are my obligations? Well, to respect authority. As a citizen, I should obey the law, for example. But also, I respect my boss. I listen to what the boss says. I follow directions. I am somebody who shows respect for people in that position. But also part of my authority relationship is that I nurture those who I am tasked with taking care of within that organization. So there is a special obligation of care and nurturing going in a downward direction in the hierarchy. And then there are, of course, others that have to do with the horizontal relations within that hierarchy. The last one I want to talk about here, and in a way the most difficult to talk about, is called purity and sanctity. That's the one that's hardest to characterize, partly because it doesn't reduce to one simple kind of characterization. But there are ways of seeing that there is something else going on here, something else that makes us feel dirty if we do certain things. We find certain things disgusting. We find certain things make us feel, well, not exactly guilty, but kind of guilty. Like, that was not dignified. I should not have done that. So one way of saying this is just, broadly speaking, be virtuous. Another would be to say, well, in some societies, you know, observe what is clean and what is unclean, avoid the unclean. Pursue the clean, love traditional religious things. In our own culture and in other cultures, involve that conception of what is clean and unclean. And when, in the Old Testament, for example, the Hebrew Bible is talking about that sense of what is clean, what is unclean, they're talking about this. They're talking about purity and sanctity. Now, some people in the modern world say, well, I, I don't think that's even a thing. But it's not purely a religious value. It's something that goes to a deeper sense of being virtuous, um, I'll just say respecting dignity, including your own dignity, but the dignity of all human beings, that's something that seems important to us. And let me give you a little example that might mobilize your feeling about this and make it clear that it's not just a religious feeling, though it is partly a religious feeling. One time I was with a group of people in my wife's family who were taking a trip to um, a, a certain thing that we were going to visit that day, and they brought along lunch, because it wasn't going to be in a place where it's very easy to just grab lunch along the way. And so they brought this, the things for a picnic. Well, when we got there, it was on the shore, and we thought, oh, it'd be great. We can have sort of a picnic near the beach and then do our thing. Well, there was no way to get to the beach. And in the surrounding area around where we were, there were, there were just communities, narrow roads, there was a large parking lot. There was no pleasant place to have a picnic at all. But a little down the road was a cemetery. So several of them said, I've got an idea. We'll just go down to the cemetery. And so they did. They took the picnic blankets and the picnic lunch, went down to the cemetery, 
found a little space between the headstones, and laid out the picnic lunch. Now, I couldn't do it. I could not sit down in the midst of a cemetery and have a picnic lunch. I took my sandwich, walked over to the edge outside the cemetery, and ate my sandwich there. Well, do I think that by eating the sandwich in the cemetery, I was hurting anyone? No. The dead presumably did not care. There were no relatives of the dead around to observe this, so we were really alone in the place. There was no one else to be hurt by it. Did it show a lack of care? Well, not to anybody who was alive. Um, was it somehow unfair? Did it treat people unequally? Well, no. Um, did it show some kind of disloyalty or betrayal to some group I was part of? No. <laughs> Um, did it betray some special duty I have to a fa family member or a fellow employee or something? No. Was there an authority I was disobeying? No, there was no rule against this. Um, no, there, well, actually, maybe there was. I'm not sure. <laughs> but that's not why I was worried about it. Um, was I failing to care for someone, nurture somebody under my responsibility? No. Um, it came down to this, really. I thought I was not respecting the dignity the importance of a cemetery as a place to memorialize the dead. I thought I was showing disrespect for the dead. That doesn't really fall under the category of harm, or fairness, or in-group loyalty, or authority and respect. It's really just a question of, wait a minute. I mean, maybe you could say respect if you think of the hierarchy as involving the tradition, and the dead as part of that tradition, and they're above me in the hierarchy. Maybe I could do it that way. but. I really felt like somehow I was polluting the cemetery if I sat down and ate a sandwich there, and I was somehow polluting myself for having done it. I couldn't bring myself to do it. It seemed undignified. It seemed to be violating my dignity and the dignity of the place and the dignity of those who were buried there. I couldn't do it. Well, there are things like that. There are things we consider holy, for example. And yes, that's partly a religious concept. But it's not just a religious concept. There are things we think deserve a certain respect, a certain dignity. Have, if not holiness in the religious sense exactly, a kind of, well, numinous character to them. What I mean by that is there's something beyond just what appears there. And I feel that a cemetery is like that. A historical monument might be like that. That represents something that goes beyond you and me and the people alive and the way we feel about things. There is an aspect of history that's like that. A work of literature feels to me like that. A work of philosophy. Yes, it's not just the work produced by T.S. Eliot or James Joyce or Rudyard Kipling or uh, Thomas Stern or someone else. Virgil, it is somehow a monument. A monument in our civilization that deserves respect. And so there is something about that category that I at least think is onto something deep and important about morality and that in many other cultures plays a really central role. You can see that in the Hebrew Bible, but anthropologists have found that all over the world. In fact, if you go to other civilizations, other cultures in different parts of the world, you find out, yes, these are there, but often these are the ones that are actually taken to be more important. The group binding aspect, binding the group together and allowing the group to thrive, those are actually viewed as more important than the ones that are involved with the individual. The idea among some African tribes, like the Akan, for example, is really these are more fundamental. A violation of these is more serious. Why? Because it threatens the group. This threatens at most you and a few in other individual people. This threatens the entire group. And that's a much more dangerous situation. Well, as I mentioned, some people have a sixth foundation, a foundation of liberty or autonomy. And they think, look, regardless of what I do or don't do, being able to choose to do it is really fundamental. In some political philosophies, that is fundamental. In John Locke, in Kant, that's really there as a very fundamental category. And we might put it there, there as a sixth foundation. I think a lot of people do. On the other hand, a lot of people will say, well, ethics is not so much about who gets to choose. Yes, I like it better if I get to choose. On the other hand, it, what I'm talking about is choosing the right thing or the wrong thing, doing the right thing or the wrong thing. It's not really a matter of who's choosing it. That's not what this is really primarily about. So however you feel about that liberty-autonomy dimension, I think it's fair to say, well, 
It differs in a certain way. It's about how all this happens, but this is about what ought to happen. And so these are the five basic foundations, and these then, according to moral foundations theory, would be the basic rules. Some of them are right there in W.D. Ross and agree with that sort of common sense morality. Some may be slightly more surprising and maybe much more detailed in the sense that they go into the special obligations arising out of specific relationships or the nature of specific groups. This is primarily a psychological theory, but I think it's something that ethicists need to think about whether they approach it from a practical point of view, an ethical sort of theory point of view within philosophy, from the point of view of anthropology or psychology, all of those I think, can ask the same basic question. What is it that really drives our moral thinking in the end? And what values do we take as basic? This is a theory that tries to answer that, and answer it through a lot of cross-cultural comparison and through a lot of empirical research. It's something that I think people within philosophy as well as psychology, and people within organizations or just in everyday life, should pay much closer attention to. It will make you sensitive to dimensions of problems you may not have been sensitive to before.